So I downloaded this rock clock app from Dwayne the Rock Johnson, and I feel like it's like really getting like to me because yesterday I had a dream that I was hanging out with the Rock and having this like in-depth conversation about like health and fitness and like just you know what you can do, and you know like my 30th birthday is coming up in like six weeks, and so it's all downhill from there in my mind, <laughs> and so. But he, he was very motivational. He was very, very like, you can do it, you got this, and so change of plans. So uh, one of the cool things about the app, though, is that you can change, you can sync your alarm clock to the Rock's alarm clock, and so you get up when he gets up. And so I almost take it as a personal challenge now to try and wake up before he gets up. Except, except, Rock, if you see this, you lied this morning. You told us you were getting up at 5 o'clock. That's what it was synced to. But then the little motivational message in the morning was him from last night saying that he was shooting an all-nighter. They were shooting Baywatch from Baywatch from uh, nine to seven. That's not your alarm clock, then. Don't lie to me, Rock. Don't lie to me. Let's answer some questions. Ask away. It's F and F Q and A. This owner asks, what tiers do you have for goal retention, rebooking, and memberships, if that applies for your stylist? <clears throat> this is a fantastic question because all of these, well, memberships don't quite apply to us. I wish that we could do memberships. Salon transcripts, update your software. Um, these are all factors that play into our career path that we've designed for our team, right? So in terms of goal retention, the number one thing that our stylists have to do is get those guests to come back. So of our three tiers, as you grow, we're looking for a 70, 80, and 90% retention as part of them being able to then raise their menu price. In terms of rebooking, uh, rebooking is actually getting a lot harder, I think, uh, either generationally, people don't want to commit. So we actually start our pre-booking, uh, I believe it's 60, 70, and 80%. Now some people might say that's really low. but it's just, it's a matter of the times, I believe. Uh, you know, old school, it might have been easier to get that set up, but I think today people are a little less committal. They also like online booking. Uh, and so it's just uh, part of the times, but those are our, our uh, standards for our career path. This stylist wants to know, how do you enforce policies on requiring a deposit for clients who no call or no show or cancel an appointment within 24 hours? Definitely one of the more frustrating parts of our job, right? Because we understand we've got a reservation and if it doesn't get filled or people fill it and then no show or cancel at the last minute, we're kind of we're kind of sunk. Um, I will say that for Hairloft, we do not have a cancellation policy. Um, we understand that things come up. Uh, if it continues to be an issue, maybe, but we've, we've never had a, a repetitive issue enough for us to change our policy. Um, I think the biggest factor in this right now is going to be do you have a software solution to secure those credit cards? Back in the day, people would just you know write down a little credit card number, expiration date, and just add it to their, their client profile or put it in their Rolodex or something like that. But today, with the amount of technology and credit card hacks and the, all the new cards with their chip and pin, um, not to say that salons are probably the largest target for credit card fraud, but you want to protect yourself. And so you have to have a software solution that uh, is enabled to be able to secure cards and charge them out. Uh, and if you have this written down on your website or in your menu and you've communicated it, then it's open knowledge. And if you have the card, then you should be good to go in terms of being able to enforce it. This stylist asks, what is the best way to approach and enforce a children's policy in the salon to prevent clients from bringing their children along with them to appointments? I, I like this question because I was totally, the, I would have been this kid that you didn't want. Like I would run up and down the, the aisle, I would get on the chairs and spin them around like I was skateboarding in a circle. Sometimes I still do that. but. Um, I, I think that the easiest way, because obviously we don't want to, we don't want to tell a mother or a father like, look, your kid's a brat and you can't bring them here anymore. So I think that the easiest way to go about doing this <clears throat> is to kind of remove yourself and put the ownership on 
uh, maybe your insurance company and be able to say, you know, you know, we had a discussion with our insurance company and they said the children in the salon uh, that aren't getting services are, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A liability. A liability. Thank you. Uh, and do something along those lines. Uh, now, you're still, it, with that dialogue that I just said, you're still leaving room for them to come in if, they're, if you do kids' cuts. Uh, maybe you don't even want to do kids cuts and in that case, you know, you're going to have to say that we're trying to provide an experience for adults or, you know, those that are 13 and over, whatever the case may be. Um, so either establishing a policy saying that we're for adults or putting the ownership on an insurance company, I think, are the easiest ways to go about doing it. Uh, but keep in mind that all those people that do have kids that don't have the ability to set up a nanny or babysitter or leave them with, with family you are going to potentially lose that, those services. And so while it may be frustrating that kids do come to the salon sometimes and they are kind of uh, a challenge, um, it may be worth it in the end as long as you're able to retain the services of their parents because I'm guessing that they're not bringing them every time. Or at least I know our clients don't bring them every time. This stylist asks, how does your salon handle personal assistance for stylists? Do those stylists pay the assistance solely out of their income or split the cost with the salon? I'm not a fan of the BYOA type of philosophy to bring your own assistant to work. Um, I believe that it is a core piece of, of what ownership needs to provide for the business to thrive. Uh, I've talked tons of times on this show about it, what you need to do from an ownership standpoint of what you need to provide in order for your team to feel like that 50% that they're giving up is going to something. And the support staff that they need is part of that, whether that is an assistant to help you with blow dries or front desk or whatever the case may be. I have had friends that have worked in salons in this type of an environment, and it's insane. Like, it's insane the, 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 what goes on in those, in those environments, because it's like you're gonna get $2 for every towel you wash. That doesn't make any sense. You're gonna get $4 for every shampoo. We're only gonna schedule you for three hours because I'm only double booked tonight from four to seven. And of course, of course, nobody is actually set up as an employer. They're all just paying cash out of their pocket out of the tips that they're gonna get, which could be a whole nother discussion for another time. So to me, we don't, we don't necessarily, we, or we don't let anybody pay for their own assistant. Hairloft, the salon, provides assistance. As our team grows, and we're starting to get to the point where we are going to have to look at having more dedicated one-on-one -on -one type of assistance, because right now our assistants float the floor and kind of assist everybody, but people are getting to the, the point where they're so busy that they are gonna need somebody to sort of lock on to, and you know what? We'll adapt our program and we'll figure out how to make that happen, but it will still be the salon providing that. So, guys, this was FNF Q&A 48. Um, if you have a question, you can always submit it to me uh, via email, which is classes at ffsaloneducation.com, or you can always uh, just comment on this video, and we'll grab it. Uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, wherever you may be watching this. And please, subscribe and share with your hairstylist friends. We want to be able to help as many people have a great salon career as possible. So until the next episode, thank you very much.